If you've been in a spiritual theology two session with me, we've talked about this at some length, so you can go to sleep. The rest of you, pay attention. Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus, I think, is one of the well-known gospel stories, much loved by children and adults alike. It tells the story of Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector, and how he comes to faith. But there's more going on here than a simple conversion story, because this is a story of radical inclusion. But more than that, I think it's also a story about holiness and the challenge of discipleship. How in the world is this a story about holiness? The word holy does not appear in 10 verses. Nor do any of the common euphemisms for holiness, purity or cleanliness or wholeness. Earlier this month, we were hoping to have Jimmy Dunn come to preach. And he reminds us that the presence of holiness in the Bible is not limited to places where a particular vocabulary, whether it's hagios in Greek or kadosh in Hebrew, appears. It's possible to talk about holiness without using the word. This is where the spiritual theology guys will remember it's not unlike talking about sex. It is possible to talk about sex without using that word. Is that correct? Now everybody's quiet because we've mentioned the word. As though you don't talk about it. All right, that's fine. But we British find lots of ways to talk about this subject without using that word or any of the most common euphemisms. So why is this text about holiness and what do I mean by holiness? Ruth Etchells is someone that I admire greatly, former principal of St. John's College in Durham, and she puts it this way, holiness is actually the shining dazzle of profoundest divine love, exchanged continually within the Trinity and poured out for creation in all its forms for our deepest and most joyful good. I love that description. Because I think that Christian discipleship into which Zacchaeus is called and into which we are called, is at heart a radically inclusive call to respond with unrestrained love to the God who is pure, unbounded love. I want to say that again. Christian discipleship at its heart is a radically inclusive call to respond with unrestrained love to the God who is pure, unbounded love. So I've got a question for you. How much do you love God? Do you love God this much? Do you love God this much? Do you love God this much? How much do you love God? And the reason that question is important because if you ask the converse, how much does God love you? Is it this much? Is it this much? Or do we not have arms big enough to describe? And this story is a story of how much God loves, including such a person as Zacchaeus. So there are five things I want to draw to your attention from this text. First is the profoundly countercultural nature of this story. Luke's gospel is a story of radicality. Not so much about, not only about inclusion, but about inversion. The people that you think will be included may not be the ones who are. And the people you think are excluded may in fact turn out to be the ones who are included. And therefore, Luke's gospel routinely condemns the wealthy. And in Luke's gospel alone do you find not only blessed are the poor, but also woe to the rich. It's in Luke's gospel you find Jesus stating, you cannot serve God and mammon. And bear in mind the story we heard last week the story of the rich man and Lazarus, who ends up in Abraham's bosom. It is not the rich man, as many might expect, but Lazarus. And in chapter 18, the chapter immediately following this one, we find the story of the rich ruler and Jesus' statement, where he says, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Of God. That's a really challenging story to hear because whether you feel rich or not, globally, we are rich. So this is not a description of someone else, it's a description of us. So this is a profoundly countercultural message in a culture where many naturally assume that wealth was a sign of divine blessing. 
But equally countercultural was the idea that tax collectors, tax collectors, could have a place in the coming kingdom of God. Tax collectors, of course, were among those who were baptized by John in Luke chapter 3. Now, Levi is called to be one of Jesus' disciples in Luke chapter 5. Jesus is accused, not the word there, accused, of eating with tax collectors in Luke chapter 15. And of course, in Luke chapter 18, he tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So here's a radically inclusive gospel that has this radical inversion. Rich people whom you might think exhibit signs of blessing, they're out. Tax collectors whom everyone hates, they're in. And then we get to Zacchaeus. He's a tax collector and he's rich. What's Jesus going to do now? And not only is he a tax collector, he is a chief tax collector. That phrase occurs only here in this gospel. How will Jesus respond to him? Will Jesus respond to him as a wealthy person and therefore you expect him to have a bit of a hard time? Or will he respond to him as a tax collector? Let's save that for a moment. Let's come to the second thing to notice. The second thing is the workings of divine grace. I love the fact that Zacchaeus has no intention of engaging with Jesus at all. For him, this is a one-off. Jesus is passing through. Perhaps this is his one chance to catch a glimpse of the miracle worker from Nazareth. We know that he is a man of small stature, which presumably tells us that he's not very tall. But it might also be a way of describing the fact that he is of limited stature in that community. In other words, nobody loves the tax collector. So he goes ahead, he runs ahead, he climbs a tree, he wants to see Jesus, and he simply wants to see Jesus passing by. That's all that he wants. But Jesus has other ideas. He comes to where Zacchaeus is, he looks up to him, he calls him from where he is, and says, come down, hurry, I must stay at your house today. There's immediacy, there's urgency in this summons. Hurry. I don't know if Jesus was hungry or whether there was some urgency to this encounter. I must stay at your house today. I think that's a real sign of grace. How many of us come to faith because we get arrested by the grace of God? We were happy in trespasses and sins. Our life was fine But there is something of the grace of God that arrested us and meant that we could not continue as we were. Anybody's like that? You know, you were fine. But that was not fine for Jesus. So we see that action of divine grace of Jesus initiating something for Zacchaeus. But there is also the action of divine grace not only in Jesus' encounter, but also in Zacchaeus' desire. I want to know, and I've asked this question before, what prompts a wealthy man, a person of some significance in a community, to run ahead to climb a tree in order to see Jesus? Is Molly in the room? Excellent. So I can ask this question. Who climbed a tree recently? One of you climbed a tree recently. I'm really quite disappointed in a room this youthful. There are not so many more of you who've climbed a tree. Okay, let's put this another way. Conrad, when was the last time you climbed a tree? Can't remember. Can't remember. John, when was the last time you climbed a tree? 1942. 1942, all right. Graham, when was the last time you climbed a tree? There are no trees where you came from. That's why he's come to Britain to find a tree. My point is this. Men of a certain stature don't tend to climb trees. And certainly in that culture, in that time, men of a certain age and a certain status did not often run. Particularly if you're wearing long skirts, it's very difficult to run and look... It's actually, let's face it, it's very difficult to run and look dignified anyway. I mean, if you're Usain Bolt, you can make it look good. But for the most of us, it's really difficult to, to pull that off. And if you're running in long skirts, the only way to do it properly is to hoist them and then run. It can't be done in a dignified way. This man ran ahead. 
like the prodigal father of Luke 15, who also ran to see his son when he saw him a long way off. So it is Zacchaeus runs ahead, climbs a tree in order to see Jesus. I think it's striking that Luke, who's interested in those on the periphery, who tells this story of both the prodigal father and the prodigal tax collector, both of whom run to the object of their desire. I had a friend of mine who, who had a theory that only children and thieves are allowed to run, unless you're in running gear. If you're in running gear and you're clearly exercising, that's okay. But apart from that, children and thieves. When was the last time you ran if you weren't going for a run? Or exercising or playing a football game or whatever it is? Who runs to get from one place to another? Anybody? I, how many of you ran to chapel this morning? You ran to chapel. Did you see there's a good woman of God right there? I thought that you were just late. What prompts a man to run ahead, climb a tree to see Jesus? I want to tell you that this, I suggest, is grace. The desire that he has to see something of Jesus is an example of provenient grace. The grace that draws us to God. The grace that gives us a desire for the divine. And that grace, I think, is another way of describing divine love exchange continually within the Trinity and poured out for creation for our deepest and most joyful good. We see the workings of divine grace in Jesus taking the initiative, but we also see the workings of divine grace that makes this man hoist his skirts, run ahead, climb a tree to see a man he's never met. The third thing is the contrasting responses that we see in this story, which is where we begin to see the radicality of the inclusion. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, come down, I must eat in your house or stay in your house today. And Zacchaeus hurries down and he is happy to welcome him. But verse 6, all who saw it began to grumble and said, or verse 7, he's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Verse 6, Zacchaeus is delighted with this invitation. Verse 7, the crowd grumbles. This is not the first time that people have grumbled at Jesus eating with a tax collector in Luke's gospel. In fact, precisely this response of grumbling is recorded in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. He's eating with tax collectors. But in that instance, it's Pharisees and scribes who grumble. Christians tend not to take too much notice of what Pharisees or scribes think. We don't care about their opinions. Because they're opponents of Jesus, and therefore they're always going to oppose his actions. It's a bit like MPs. If I'm on the other side, it doesn't really matter what you say. I have to find a way of opposing it, right? And second, we think that Pharisees are hypocrites anyway, so why do we care what they think? But here it's not just Pharisees and scribes who are grumbling, but all who saw it. Everyone thinks this is a bad idea. He's going to eat with a tax collector. That's where radical inclusion gets into trouble. It's one thing to talk about it. It's one, another thing when everyone thinks these people, they're not acceptable. Why were they grumbling? Two sets of issues. One, tax collectors, pretty much seen as thieves. Who enjoys paying taxes? Anybody? Nobody. Not even one of you. Wow. Nobody likes the tax man. But it's also thought at that time that tax collectors could collect not only their taxes, but their expenses. You get a slight allusion to this in Luke chapter 3, verse 12. Where Luke tells us, even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked John, teacher, what should we do? And John says this to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. There's the illusion right there. You can collect your taxes. The system allows you to take more. If you want to be an honest tax collector, collect only what is prescribed. If tax collectors inflated their expenses, then taxpayers paid more tax than was Necessary. Anybody remember the expenses scandal in the parliament a few years back? That's what happens when people inflate their expenses. But not only that, tax collectors were seen to be sympathizers with the Romans quite often because some of those taxes went to Roman overlords to build their roads, to pay for their allegiance. 
And so if you were exploiting Jews with the benefit of helping Romans, that doesn't work out so well. And Zacchaeus is not just a tax collector. He's a chief tax collector. He is in charge. He's orchestrating the system. He has responsibility. Why would you eat with such a person? But the second issue is that table fellowship was a significant cultural issue of the day. It's striking that it's not just the Pharisees who grumbled. Everyone who saw it. Everyone thinks this is not acceptable. According to the morals of the day, we know how this works. He's a tax collector, not in. Table fellowship was an important marker of relationship in first century Jewish society. It was a marker of unity and oneness. It had symbolism of the banquet at the kingdom of God at the end of the age. Every meal was to point towards that end. And therefore, if you're looking towards that end of the age, people who are not keeping the law, why would you eat with them? Because they're not going to be in the banquet at the end. You find a similar thing from that little Pharisee called Paul later on in 1 Corinthians who says very similar things. If there is a sister or brother who is not living according to Christ, don't even eat with them. For Jesus to eat is not just a meal. It says something about what you think of that person. Who do you invite round to your house to eat? That's not a rhetorical question, by the way. Okay, friends, family. Do you tend to invite people you dislike intensely? I mean, who, who's inviting the people that they hate? We're not talking frenemies, we're talking proper ones now. That you, who do you, you don't invite those people around. If you invite them around to eat, you are saying something about the nature of this relationship. You're saying something about their value to you. These people don't care about the food, I suggest. They care about what it symbolizes. And the value that Jesus is placing on this man, who is a tax collector. But I think Jesus knows exactly what he's doing, of course. Because he is doing something I think that is really prophetic. Because here is where he demonstrates something of the radical inclusion of the gospel. Which says, this guy, we are all agreed, is a problem. But that is why the gospel is for him. To include Zacchaeus in table fellowship is indicative of the grace of the kingdom. Even people like him can be included in the holy purposes of God. I think what Jesus is doing here is doing two things. One, he's saying something about radical inclusion, but he's also saying something about radical holiness. He's saying there are no boundaries, there are no no-go areas in which God's goodness and glory may not be reflected. Anywhere, everywhere, anyone Everyone, no matter how tarnished, has the capacity by grace to become the kind of surface that can reflect God's goodness and glory. I don't know about you, but I love that. Many of you know I love cars. I lived next door to a man for five years who never washed his car. I'd be out there on the weekends, you know, polishing and shining, and he'd look at me and think, and why are you doing that? It rains. Why would you ever wash the car? And we had a driveway where our our driveways weren't shared, but they were parallel. So as I'm washing my car, his car is there. And I have to say, nearly each time I'm thinking, could I get away with just washing that car? (laughs) It's driving me slightly mad. And of course, there was a significant difference between the two. My car was all shiny, and his car was fairly... It was a beautiful car, but just... Not at all. But as I looked at it, I kept thinking, yeah, if you've got a bit of polish on that, it could be so amazing. I think that's what Jesus is doing. He looks at Zacchaeus. He doesn't overlook the fact that he's a tax collector. But even in the most tarnished of surfaces, he can see there is potential here. 
for the holiness of God to be reflected. That's what the radical inclusion is. Nobody is so far gone that they cannot be transformed by grace. What I'd like you to do for a moment is just picture the person that you think is so far gone. That might be somebody in this community. It might be that pesky relative that you're thinking about having assassinated if you can get away with it. It might be that really broken relationship that's part of your identity. And as you think about that person, so that this is not simply a theological idea, but something that's rooted in real life, think about that person, that woman, that man, and remind yourself nobody is so far gone that they cannot be transformed by grace. No person is so broken, so tarnished, so far out there that they are beyond the reach of God's transforming love. That, I think, is what we see in Jesus eating with this tax collector. And that is what the crowd has such difficulty getting their heads around. How can grace include this guy? Fourth thing. The grumbling of the crowd makes it evident that this engagement between Jesus and Zacchaeus is not a private conversation. It's not a personal transaction. Here is the gospel in action in public. Zacchaeus is summoned by grace in public. His conversation and his conversion is out in the open. There's something really profound here about the nature of Christian faith. It might be personal, but it is never private. It's public. And so says, when we see this conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus happening from verse 8 onwards, this is not a personal and private conversation. And indeed, I think that Zacchaeus is clearly addressing not Jesus, but the crowd who are inclined to grumble at the grace of God. By the way, I think Zacchaeus, and I'd love to check this out. I should have checked this out with Conrad beforehand. I think Zacchaeus is unique in Luke. Because I think in contrast to every other rich person identified in Luke, here is a man who's prepared to give away half his possessions to the poor. By the way, I should say rich man. There are some rich women who give away money in Luke. But in contrast to every other rich man identified as rich, here is a man prepared to give away half his possessions to the poor. I don't think anyone else does that. And if he's defrauded anyone, he says, he's prepared to repay four times as much. That conversation is not simply a private conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus, I suggest. I think that is a conversation that is intended to be heard by the crowd. It's not Jesus' money that he's ripped off, potentially. It's their money. They're the ones who need to know that there is recompense to come, there is restitution to be made. And so it is when Jesus speaks to Zacchaeus. I don't think Zacchaeus is the intended target of what he has to say. Again, I think it is the crowd. And there's something really interesting about the way in which the language is framed. Today, salvation has come to this house because third person, not second person, he too is the son of Abraham. He's not saying to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house because you too. But to his house because he too is a son of Abraham. This question of radical inclusion is not simply a private set of transactions between me and God. And one of the real challenges for our Christianity is that idea that me and Jesus, we're good. But in fact, as we are discovering in this place, Christianity has a communal element, which is what makes it the challenge that it is. If it were just me and Jesus, that'd be much simpler. I wouldn't have to deal with you a lot. But I do. That is what we are invited into. Discipleship, holiness, and radical inclusion are not private undertakings. And the fifth thing is just to note how this story ends with that proclamation. Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Those two innocuous sounding words, I think, 
are where the radical inclusion really comes to focus. He too. This chief tax collector, this Roman sympathizer, this extremely wealthy man, this odious little toad, this guy is also included. Though he might be ignored and obstructed by the crowd, this guy is also someone whom God's love. This person whom everyone condemns is the person in whose house Jesus will both receive and ask for hospitality. That feels like a fairly risky gospel to me. So let me ask you another question. When was the last time you took a risk for the gospel? I don't even know what that might mean for you. Let me ask myself a question, given that I'm principal of this institution. When was the last time we took a risk for the gospel? And what might that mean for us? Because I think unless we are asking that question, we're not doing anything that's, uh, well, radical. Difficult to do something radical without it being risky, I think. The gospel is not without risk. Here's the next question. And who has taken a risk on you? Some of you might not be risky at all. Nice and safe, no problem. There'll be one or two of you out there who are extremely dodgy indeed, isn't that right? And somebody, somewhere, took a risk on you. That's why you're in the room. The gospel of Jesus requires a radical inclusion, which despite Luke's repeated condemnation of the rich, seeks out and finds the worst kind of rich person, a rich person who is rich because he is a chief tax collector, and says he too has a place among us. You see, the gospel is not just for people like us. That's what we'd like it to be, if we're honest. People like us, whoever the us happens to be in that sentence. The gospel is also, perhaps is even especially for people like him. And the story ends with this pronouncement. The Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is a story of salvation. In this particular case, salvation from Excess, perhaps. This man who appears to have everything material comes to discover by God's grace that he does not have the one thing that matters most. And I suspect that is one of the reasons Zacchaeus is prepared to give away his riches. It's because he's trying to find something that money can't buy, which is true discipleship of Jesus Christ. And that leads me back to where I began, that I think Etchells is right in her perception of the integration of holiness Inclusion and divine love. Holiness is actually the shining dazzle of profoundest divine love exchanged continually within the Trinity and poured out for creation in all its forms for our deepest and most joyful good. Here's a story in which we see divine love poured out not only for Zacchaeus' good, not only for the good of all who witnessed the encounter but also for the good of all who will benefit from Zacchaeus' giving away of 50% of his enormous wealth. I keep hoping to meet some rich people who want to give away 50% of their enormous wealth to London School of Theology. If you're watching this on the video, get in touch. We'd very much like to hear from you. But think that through seriously. That's a real blessing in a context where there is no safety net, there is no social welfare. It is for the wealthy to look after the poor. But I want to finish with this reminder. Here is an unconditional love from Jesus. Jesus doesn't ask Zacchaeus anything. He doesn't say, if you repent, then I'll eat with you, or whatever. It's an unconditional offer of love. But that unconditional offer does not come without some challenge. That love challenges Zacchaeus 
to think through who he is going to be and to how he is going to respond. We must rightly talk a great deal about God's love. That is what the gospel is about. But if we think of God's love as simply something that makes us feel warm and cuddly inside, we have not fully understood it. It is also a love that challenges us to be the best version of ourselves. Challenges us to be all that God calls us to be. Challenges us to reflect that person who is that divine love. And that's a much more challenging thing. So I want to finish by simply asking, who do we need to love a little more as we think about radical inclusion? We've looked at a number of things across this passage. Conrad is right in talking about the ways in which God has chosen to surprise us since Easter as we've begun on this journey. Who are some of the people who are difficult to love for us? For whom, if this talk of radical inclusion isn't just going to be talk, part of our challenge is to figure out how do we love people like them and to express something of God's love for them. My guess is if you've got two or three people for whom this is a challenge, you won't have to think too hard about who they are. They'll be at the forefront of your mind. You'll have a picture of their faces and you'll be gritting your teeth about now to say, nope, not going to do that. Not going there. Thank you very much. But that is what love is about. Let's pray. Loving God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this series. Thank you for its ongoing challenge. Thank you for this story of Zacchaeus, well known to so many of us, but which is so full of reminders of your unconditional love, your divine grace, which loves us as we are, but loves us too much to leave us as we are. And so you draw us into change. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see as Jesus has eyes to see. That there are no no no-go areas for your grace. That anyone and everyone, anywhere and everywhere, is full of divine capacity to reflect your goodness and glory and holiness in the world. Father, may we be emissaries of your gospel, of that radical inclusion which you embody. And we pray that by your spirit and through your grace, you would transform this community, transform the communities from which we come, so that this gospel of radical inclusion about which we have been hearing and upon which we have been focusing may become more and more of a reality in our lives. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.